<laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our CPCT research seminar and the first instantiation of the spring term series. Um, so today's seminar is part of um, this term's um, um, theme, what is global critical theory that we've been working on over the last um, two years already um, with different emphases. And I'm very happy uh, to welcome Mathieu Renaud um, today as our speaker. Um, just before I introduce um, Mathieu, um, I just want to say we are recording this seminar um, in order to put it up on our YouTube channel um, afterwards. The talk will be um, roughly 50, 55 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. And for the questions, um, you'll also be able to speak or to write in the chat. Um, so we'll enable those functionalities later on. Um, but if you have any questions on your mind already, you can submit them um, via the Q&A button um, and then we can address them after Mathieu um, has uh, presented. Um, so um, I would like to really warmly welcome Mathieu Renaud, um, who is a professor at um, the University of Toulouse, Jean Jaurès. Um, I'm extremely excited um, uh, to have Mathieu here in part of our seminar series. I've kind of been um, uh, mentioning his work to my students, especially um, his book on Jean Locke, um, but he's an extremely prolific writer, has widely published um, in French books on Fanon, on Locke, on C.L.R. James, on Lenin and the question of decolonization of the Russian Empire, on Du Bois. Um, and is currently um, or has a book forthcoming this year on masters and slaves archives of an analytical laboratory of the myth of modernity. Um, so um, whilst the books are mainly published in French, um, there are quite a few chapters, quite a few articles in radical philosophy and other English publications. So I um, recommend you having a look for those. Um, and um, yeah, so Mathieu is a professor in critical history of philosophy at the University of uh, Toulouse, and he's also a member of the research team on philosophical rationalities and knowledge. And his research generally focuses on the relationships between philosophy and non-European societies, the post-imperial history of knowledge, and its minority rewritings um, along the lines of class, gender, and race. Um, so um, I will hand over um, to Mathieu, who will be um, speaking to us today on rewriting the decline of the West in the Black Atlantic, um, specifically on Caribbean and African American rewritings. Thank you very much for this invitation, and I will start now. And uh, I'd like to begin this talk by comparing two extracts from the work of the African-American writer, theorist, and activist W.E.B. Du Bois. Two extracts that are situated more or less at the two hands of his intellectual and political trajectory at a distance of more than half a century. The first one is taken from an article Du Bois wrote in 1906 at the request of Max Weber entitled The Negro Question in the U.S. Quote, above all, consider one thing, the day of the colored race, sanity to delay this development, it is wisdom to promote what it promises in light for the future. The second extract comes from a poem, Ghana Calls, dated 1960, three years before Du Bois died in Accra, where he had found a refuge and a poem which is dedicated to Kwame Nkrumah. Quote, I lift my last voice and cried. I cried to heaven as I died. Oh, turn me to the golden hoard, summon all Western nations toward the rising sun. From reeking west whose day is dawn, who stink and stagger in their dung, 
toward Africa, China, India strand, where Kenya and Himalaya stand, and Nile and Yangtze roll, turn every yearning face of man." Unquote. The major contrast be between these two texts can be illustrated as follows. In the era of anti-colonial independence, the idea of the emancipation of peoples of color conceived of as birth or rebirth, uplift, ascent, as set out by Du Bois at the dawn of the 20th century, this idea is now coupled with and becomes indissociable from the idea of the decline of the West. This idea was totally absent from the writings of the young Du Bois, who in 1903, in his masterpiece, The Souls of Black Folk, hoped that the black man would soon become, alongside the white man, a collaborator in the kingdom of culture, in the singular. The challenge then is to understand how, onto the theme of the dawn of the black people, in the US and at a global level, a solar metaphor which is absolutely central to the souls, the second chapters on the decades following the abolition of slavery in the United States is entitled The Dawn of Freedom. The challenge is to understand how on this theme is gradually grafted another one, the theme of the twilight or dusk of the white people. The first shift sequence in this respect was the First World War, during which Du Bois, in a series of article, articles, lectures, and editorials to which Alberto Toscano has devoted in-depth analysis, revealed the colonial origins of the war, and more specifically established an intimate connection between the division and exploitation of Africa by European powers following the Congress of Berlin of 1884-1885, and the outbreak of the world conflict as a result of the imperialist rivalries that this division had engendered. It was at this point that Du Bois, like many other non-white intellectuals, began to lose faith and confidence in the West as a force of progress. As he wrote in The African Roots of War, an article published in The Atlantic in 1915, quote, in a very real sense, Africa is a prime cause of this terrible overturning of civilization, which we have lived to see, unquote. It was during the same year that Du Bois designed that singular sub supplement to the souls of the black, of black folk, uh, that is his essay, The Souls of White Folk, where he castigated in a pioneering way what he called the religion of whiteness, a religion of whiteness which postulates that being white means having title to, to the universe and therefore the right to exploit darker people. This critic of whiteness finds an extension in the aftermath of the second K episode in the, in the evolution I am tracing back here roughly, namely the Second World War, more precisely in 1947 in the first chapters of Du Bois book, The World and Africa. The very first chapter is significantly titled The Collapse of Europe. This greatest tragedy, says Du Bois, that has overtaken the world is all the more painful because of the boundless face we have had in European civilization." Unquote. The author recommends a calm appraisal of the situation based on an understanding of the nature of the catastrophe as a direct outgrowth of the past. In other words, as the effect of the imperialist outburst that led to the First World Conflict, and of the bitter struggle against communism that led to the second. But this history continues in the next chapters, the white masters of the world, has actually much deeper roots. It goes back to the invention of the doctrine of the superior race in conjunction with the development of the slave system, 
and to the development of the cor corollary creed of the white man's burden, the, civiliz the civilizing mission of the West. And Du Bois concludes this second chapter, quote, I believe that the trade in human beings between Africa and America, which flourished between the Renaissance and the American Civil War, is the prime and effective cause of the contradiction in European civilization and the illogic in modern thought and the collapse of human culture. To put it differently, for Du Bois, the slave and colonial exploitation of the so-called dark races on which Western civilization was built had at the same time sown the seeds of its future dissolution, its self-destruction. As for the people of color, Du Bois suggests on the eve of the struggle for independence that they are called upon to rise from the rubble of the old imperialist Europe and to construct on its ruins a radically new civilization. The gap between the thesis of the young Du Bois and the old Du Bois reveals a profound maturation and radicalization of black anti-racist and anti-colonial thought, which is the product of both and without contradiction, its affirmation and growing autonomy from white political thought on the one hand, and on the other, of its increasingly close connection, implicit or explicit, with historical materialism, and more specifically with Marxist theorization of imperialism and the collapse of capitalism. But there is another source, another influence that has remained more secret and has rare, rarely been put forward by interpreters of the black radical tradition, perhaps because it was more troubling. It is the influence of the commonly politically conservative declinist thought which had proliferated in Europe since the First World War and which diagnosed or prophesied with lamentations the ir irreversible decline of the continent of Europe and of the civilization that had matures on its soul before spreading across the globe. The philosophical manifesto of this tendency, or, one, or would one prefer to say this mood, was Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West, published in two voluminous volumes in 1918 for the first and 1922 for the second. Untergang des Abendlandes in German, a title that it would not have been illegitimate to translate as The Twilight of the West. Du Bois Archives tells us that he had ordered a copy of Spengler's book in 1927, shortly after the publication of its first English translation and under the title, The Downfall of Western Civilization. Incidentally, a passage from a late Du Bois novels, novel, Worlds of Color, the last piece in, his, in the trilogy, The Black Flame, published in 1961, bears witness to this reading of Spengler. Du Bois says that flame of the North with its seen paleness will fail. And Spengler has told us how the flame of the waste is declining. What did Du Bois peripherally and other black intellectual more consistently as we shall see, find in and draw from Spengler the apostle of the conservative revolution beyond his assessment or his vision of the agony of the Western world. First of all, I think, a virulent criticism of Eurocentrism in philosophy and history, which had hardly any equivalent in the so-called progressive thought of the time, whether liberal or revolutionary, and which, whether we like it or not, is certainly the closest things in early 20th century Western philosophy to perspectives that contemporary postcolonial and decolonial theories have made familiar to us. This criticism is phrased in the introduction to the decline of the West, 
in which Spengler attacks the classic division of universal history into three periods, antiquity, the Middle Age, and modern times. This incredibly jejun and meaningless scheme, he say, subordinates, quote, general history of higher mankind to the little part world which has developed on West European soil from the time of the German Ro Roman Empire, crassly ignoring China and Mexico, the empire of Aksum, and that of the Sassanids, among other cultures. In this scheme, Europe is seen as the, as the steady pole around which other cultures gravitate, like the Earth in Ptolemy's planetary system. According to a terrible optical illusion, it is from the perspective of this supposed central sun, says Spengler, that non-Western societies are arrogantly judged and that any proper and independent historicity are denied to them or, quote, made to shrink to the dimensions of mere episodes. To this Ptolemaic system of history, Spengler opposes his Copernican discovery in the, in the historical sphere, which amounts to a radical decentering that, quote, admits no sort of privileged position to the classical or the Western culture as against the culture of India, Babylon, China, Egypt, the Arabs, Mexico. A radical decentering that suspends the, the identification of the meaning of the world with its reflection in the brain of West, Western European individual. Let's precise, however, that Spengler's decentering remains singularly limited given that he only consider worthy of attention what he called and deems to be height cultures, which are quite few in number. Another aspect of Spengler thought was particularly likely to be appealing to his non-European readers, namely his notion of imperialism as the main symptom alongside the formation of cosmopolitan world cities, the main symptom of the decline of great culture. That is to say, in his own terms, of their coming to their terminal stage, the stage of civilization. Imperialism, Spengler asserts, has always been in all culture, Babylon, Egypt, India, China, the Roman Empire, the typical symbol of the passing away. Imperialism is, quote, civilization unad unadulterated. It cannot be otherwise for the rest, which in this irrevocable phenomenon is fulfilling its destiny. As was already attested in the second half of the 19th century by the trajectory of the British tycoon and politician Cecil Rhodes, whom Lenin in imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, had also elevated to the rank of archetypal imperialist. For Spengler, Rhodes, with his project for a South African empire and his, and his notion of the, of the great duty to civilization, paved the way for, quote, a future which is still in store for us and with which the history of the West of Western European mankind will be definitely, definitely closed. However, one will look in vain for a proper criticism of imperialism in Spengler, and that for two reasons. Firstly, because what Spengler names the definitive world conceptions, Stoicism and Buddhism in the past, socialism in the present, also, also opposed to the, to the imperialist principle, are nonetheless, for him, its spiritual analog and are therefore condemned either to impotence or to late conversion to that very imperialist principle. On the other hand, because decline is an organic destiny endowed with necessity, there is no point, according to Spengler, in trying to resist it. One must embrace it without hope of salvation, an attitude which Spengler translated into unreserved support 
for Prussianist German imperialism. We know that when its first volume appeared in 1918, the decline of the West was a dazzling success in Germany and in Europe more generally. Spengler's name was on everyone's lips. But it's, it is also astonishing to note, as Adorno points out in his essay Spengler after the decline, how quickly it was forgotten. So much so that four years later, its second volume passed comparatively unnoticed. But it's not generally known that Spengler's book was circulated no less intensively and for a longer period of time outside Europe on a global scale on almost every continent. This other non-European history has three distinctive features which we can outline briefly and roughly again. Firstly, and still generally speaking, there is virtually no reception of Spengler in the non-Western world that has not been at the same time a selective and transformative appropriation involving processes of theoretical and political translation and sometimes inversion of Spengler thesis, a, re a rewriting of the decline of the West. Secondly, and specif specifying the foregoing, the most frequent move has consisted, for reasons that would be easy to explain, in doubling the pessimistic thesis, even if Spengler denied that it was so pessimistic, doubling this thesis of the decline of the West with the optimistic thesis of the rise or rebirth of non-European cultures and societies, and in dialectizing these two antithetical movements. Thirdly, and uh, symptomatically, while European readings of Spengler's book have essentially concentrated on its first volume, Form and Reality, which sets out, sets out his philosophy or morphology of history in its necessity, its universality, and from the point of view of the autonomous or organic development of culture, non-European readings have generally favor, favored the second volume, Perspectives of World History, which give much more attention to contingency and the particularities of heterogeneous historical developments, and which do so precisely because Spengler consistently deals with what he calls intercultural relations, while persisting in seeing them only as accidents, probably because they threaten to undermine from within the philosophical historical system he's trying to build. What is at stake in tracing back this episode among many others yet to be recovered in a global history of philosophy. First of all, and following on from my dissertation work on Fanon, in which I studied the variations Fanon applied to Freudian and Jungian civilizational uh, themes, we need to, me to measure what happens to intra-Western or intra-civilizational critics of Western civilization when they are taken up outside the West. When, in other words, they are diverted and turned against Western domination or hegemony on a dual geopolitical and epistemic level. In Spengler's case, this first challenge is compounded by another, namely to pose afresh from a non-Western point of view and from a minority standpoint in particular, the question of the extent to which and the means or strategies by which conservative, reactionary, and as we shall see even openly fascist thought can be subverted and may be converted into emancipatory or even genuine revolutionary perspective. Let's make clear that this, of course, did not prevent Spengler from being used in fascist ways outside Europe, as it was the case in Japan during the interwar period. My presentation today focuses on a central, albeit fra fragmentary, dimension of this history, 
namely the main Africana and essentially Afro-Caribbean appropriation of Spengler's philosophy. But before that, I must first make a detour by the place where the decline of the West undoubtedly had the strongest intellectual and political impact outside Europe and perhaps more generally in the world, Latin America. Latin America and Spengler mania began with the publication in 1925 of a translation of the decline of the West under the title La Decadencia del Occidente, thanks to the effort of the Spanish philosopher José Ortega y Gasset, also founder of the Revista del Occidente, which a journal read throughout the Spanish-speaking world and uh, which was to be the vehicle for lively debates about Spengler. But there was an Argentinian historian and linguist who had not waited for this translation to appear to begin teaching and writing ex extensively about Spengler to correspond with him and visit him in Germany, in short, to take on the role of passer and to spread his oracles about the end of the West across the American continent. This was Ernesto Quesada, write the name. Ernesto Quesada, who set himself the task of linking Spengler Heides with those of the growing indig indigenous movement. This task was soon pursued by the Peruvian anthropologist Ernesto Valcarcel, the author in 1929 of one of the main manifestos of Latin American indig indigenism, Tempesta de los Andes, Storm in the Andes. Both Quesada and Valcarcel were committed to closely connecting, connecting the theme of the decline of the West with that of the revitalization of native American worlds within which high cultures had once flourished before the European conquest, the Incas in particular. More precisely, Quesada and Valcarcel aimed at prophesying the rebirth of the so-called Indian fellas of Americas. Fela, a term borrowed from Spengler that in his cyclical conception of history, and in contrast to the primitives that live before the birth of a culture, name the peoples which come after the decline and death of a culture. The, these fella are peasants peoples who, says Valcarcel, like fallow land, have been left uncultivated and rest before the great awakening, a phenomenon that, by the way, was completely impossible from a strictly Spenglerian point of view, according to which dead culture never resurrect. Incidentally, there is a great deal of work to be done on the diffused legacy of the Spenglerian concept of fella, which, to give few examples, was also taken up from a Jewish point of view as early as the turn of the 20s by rabbis in critical essays on Spenglers, and later by the American Jewish novelist Saul Bello, and which is also found centrally in other American writers such as Jack Kerouac. And end of this parenthesis. Finally, the mark of the decline of the West is just as evident in the writing of, of the first great Latin American Marxist, also a Peruvian, Jose Carlos Mariategui, who prefaced Valcarcel's book and who, like Du Bois, was fond of solar metaphors of dawn and dusk. Establishing a close dialogue between Spengler on the one hand, Lenin and Trotsky on the other, Maria Tegui combined, combines the indigenous thesis of the renewal of native Indian culture with the idea, anti-Spenglerian anti again, of an imminent revolutionary rebirth of Europe as being the continent, he says, of maximum palingenesis, 
implying both resurrection and radical transformation. Meanwhile, in Brazil, the ideas of the decline of the West found their way into the pages of the Revista de, de Antropophagia, where in 1929, Osvaldo Costa, in a tremendous foreshadowing of contemporary decolonial arguments, wrote at the end of an article, quote, Westernized Brazil is a case of historical pseudomorphosis, between brackets, see Spengler, only anthropophagy can solve it, how by eating it, unquote, in other words, by devouring the West. The concept of pseudomorphosis had been borrowed by Spengler through goat and mineralogy in order to describe, I quote Spengler, those cases in which an older alien culture lies so massively over the land that a young culture born in this land cannot get its breath and fails not only to achieve pure and specific expression forms, but even to develop fully its own self-consciousness. Applied by Spengler to the relationship between the young Arab culture and the declining Roman Empire, and between Petrine Russia and the aging West, the concept of pseudomorphosis was to be absolutely crucial for modern Western appropriation of the decline of the West in order to problematize, so to speak, colonial and postcolonial alienation. A few years later, in 1933, in his master and slave, Casa Grande e Sansala, in the Portuguese original, Gilberto Freire borrowed from the author of The Decline of the West his non-biological, environmentalist conception of race as shaped by the landscape, which is the reason why, as Spengler put it, a race does not migrate. He borrowed from Spengler also his reflection on the house as the purest expression of race, in order to conceive of the master's house and the slave quarters as the cradle of Brazilian society and civilization, to say it otherwise, of a racial democracy founded on miscegenation. In addition to this subcontinental expansion, the decline of the West also had an insular, archipelagic destiny. In the Canary Islands, first of all, where the poet Pedro Garcia Cabrera, in an essay entitled Man According to Landscape, in particular, denounced the non-critical production by Canarian writers of previous generation of, he says, falsify regional forms molded as they were into those of the dominant Iberian literature. Such regional pseudomorphosis, he says, in, a, in an orthodox Penglerian way, can only be stopped by a return to the primitive protoforms that emerge from the native landscape to the prehistoric landscape as the primordial cell of cultures. On the other side of the Atlantic, in Puerto Rico, Luis Pales Matos defended similar thesis and in turn conceived of the people as a compromise between race and landscape, arguing that after several centuries of colonization, the white West Indians, the Creoles, no longer really belonged to the Hispanic race which was probably for the best since while America was, in, according to him, in its ascendant phase of culture, Spain was on the slope of decline, becoming civilization. Although being a white writer, Palace Matos, who author, author, authored in 1926 a famous poem titled The Black People, is also considered as a pioneer, Afro uh, pioneer of Afro-Caribbean poetry in Spanish. And in his essays, he repeatedly emphasizes the fundamental role played by, quote, the Negroid factor in the West Indian psyche. This not without reintroducing a biological, non-Spanglorian notion of race. It is what allowed Antonio Corretre, a Puerto Rican poet and activist for independence, in an article published in 1936 un under the title Spengler 
una proyección criolla, Spengler, a creole projection, to assert that the author, author of the decline of the West had become, quote, the intellectual apostle of the emergence of the black man in the European artistic sphere. European meaning here Caribbean peoples of white descent. Such a phenomenon is all the more surprising that Spengler, while advocating a Copernican decentering of the, of the philosophy of history, as shown before, had in no way felt compelled to challenge the old Hegelian, among others, tradition of outright expulsion of Black Africa from universal history. An equally pivotal trans transplantation of the decline of the West took place in Cuba in the wake of Afro-Cubanism. While Spengler's influence remains apparently discreet in the work of the Afro-Cuban poet and champion of miscegenation, Nicolas Guillen, it is critical in the work of Alejo Carpentier, write his name. Also a white, a white writer, who in his first novel, Equayambeo, painted a portrait of Havana's Afro-descendant community. During the Second World War, Carpentier wrote a series of articles that have been collected under the title El Ocaso de Europa, The Twilight or Decline of Europe. After that, he aimed at redesigning a, a scheme of cultural cycles in order to show the inevitability of the transatlantic shift of the seat of universal culture from old Europe to young America. In a famous essay on the marvelous real, Carpentier again evokes, using pivotal concepts in Spengler, the Caribbean landscape and the Faustian presence of the Indian and the Black in the West Indies. Sp uh, Carpentier was also a major storyteller of worlds in ruins, as illustrated by the final chapters of his 1949 wonderful novel on the Haitian Revolution, The Kingdom of This World, which pictures the destruction of King Christophe Sans Souci Palace and the incompletion of the Lafarriere Citadel in the north of Haiti. Finally, Carpentier, born in Switzerland, lived for a long period, for long periods in France, where he maintained close ties with the authors of the Negritude movement, first and foremost M. Césaire, whose writings I shall now examine after allowing myself another, albeit much briefer, detour via the United States. Spengler influence on North American literatures from the 20s to the 60s cannot be overestimated. Suffice it to mention in no particular order the names of John Scott Fitzgerald, John Fante, Henry Miller, Lovecraft, or Below and Kerouac mentioned above, and no doubt many others. There was a passer in this affair too, named Henry Louis Mencken, and often nicknamed the Sage of Baltimore or the American Niche. To give a vague idea of his notoriety, it should be noted that following the publication of The Decline of the West, John Dewey described Spengler as a learned German Mencken. The comparison went this way, not the other. If Mencken deserves our attention here, it is because he was also committed to promoting African American writers. He had published Du Bois, as well as the authors of the Harlem Renaissance, with whom he had close ties, Claude McKay, Langston Hughes, and George Wheeler, whom I will talk about later. In a 1934 short story by Hughes, Langston Hughes, The Blues I'm Playing, set in Paris, the main female character, named Osceola, pokes fun at the black Algerians, as she says, and French West Indian students who spend their time ranting about Marcus Garvey, Picasso, Jean Cocteau, and Spengler. Perhaps you is thinking here of those who were to become the Caribbean representatives of the Negritude movement, who were strongly inspired, inspired by the Harlem Renaissance, and who a few years later, during the Second World War, founded in Martinique the journal Tropic. 
Among them was Susan Caesar, who penned such remarkable essays of culture critique as Malaise dans une civilisation, in a reference to Freud, and Leo Frobenius et le problème des civilisations, dedicated to the German Africanist anthropologist Frobenius, a spiritual father of negritude, but also a pioneer of cultural morphology whose footsteps had been followed by Spengler. Spengler's apparition onto, onto the negritude scene happened in 1939, a few years after the publication of the French translation of The Decline of the West by the Algerian Kabyle philosopher Mohan Tazerut, whose work, by the way, still need to be excavated. It was in Caesar's notebook of a return to the native land. Caesar's depiction of the Martinique landscape and of Fort de France in particular, a town, he says, incapable of growing with the juice of this earth, earth self-conscious, clipped, reduced in breach of, reduced in breach of fauna and flora, stands, unquote, stands in many ways as an antithesis to the Spenglerian botany of cultures. Elsewhere in the poem, Caesar, Caesar writes, quote, and there are those who believe that being a nigger is like being a second class clerk, waiting for a better deal and upward mobility. Those who beat the drum of compromise in front of themselves, those who live in their own oubliette, those who say to Europe, you see, I can bow and scrap like you. I pay my respect. In short, I am not different from you. Pay no attention to my black skin. The sun did it, unquote. A verse was omitted from the translation by Clayton Eshelman and Annette Smith of this passage or more exactly, a verse was replaced. In the French original, Césaire makes no reference to any oubliettes, but talk in Spenglerian terms of ceux qui se drape de pseudomorphose fière, or those who drape themselves in proud pseudomorphosis. With these words, Césaire castigates those of his compatriots who deliberately mold themselves into distorted colonial European forms that preclude any spontaneous organic generation. For Césaire, Martinique's pseudomorphosis is the other name for the assimilation policies implemented in metropolitan France and for their internalization by colonized people. Césaire's discourse of alienation is complemented by apocalyptic uh, motifs which have deep roots in the black radical tradition. They show up here through a voice which, condemning Europe that for centuries, quote, has false fed us with lies and bloated us with pestilence, as the penetrance, Caesar says, of an apocalyptic wasp. For, as Caesar says in, in a well known verse, the only thing in the world war's beginning, the end of the world, of course. Eleven years later, in his discourse on colonialism, Caesar, before Du Bois, uses organicist term to describe Europe's putrefaction, decomposition, quote, a significant thing, it's not the head uh, of a civilization that begins to rot first, it is the hurt. Those terms, are also that of morbidity, of morbidity and vital alteration, quote, a civilization which justifies colonization and therefore force is already a sick civilization. Colonization is, Caesar uh, tells, drawing on the old discourse of racial degeneration, is a tar in French, in the literal sense of the word, a stain in English, and I'm not sure it is a right translation. Caesar's discourse on colonialism is a meditation on civil civilizational decadence. Quote, a civilization that proves incapable of solving the problem it creates, and this is evidently, evidently the case with Western civilization as it has been shaped by two centuries of bourgeois rule, is a decadent civilization. 
But Caesar goes a step further. For him, colonialism and imperialism are not the last stage before the end. They are the end itself. European civilization, he asserts, quote, feels itself to be a corpse. Colonialism and imperialism are not the final manifestation of a culture that has reached its, its twilight, aging, but nonetheless still alive. It is the annihilation of all culture under the guise of, quote, a campaign to civilize barbarism from which there may emerge at any moment the negation of civilization, pure and simple, unquote. For Césaire, Nazism, after all, was only the product of the re-internalization on the European soil of such an outright negation, which had first taken place in colonized Africa and America and Asia. Césaire then refers to Spengler in his speech to the first International Congress of Black Writers and Artists held at the Sorbonne in 1966 under the title Culture and Colonization. In it, he quoted the decline of the West or more precisely, Goethe, as quoted by Spengler, and I could not find original yet, it's my translation from French, quote, you must be like that, no one can escape his head. So says Apollo, so said the prophet. Developed by, by living, the form imprinted in you, neither time nor king nor you can break it up. Césaire relocates this Goethean and Spenglerian stance in the Caribbean, to phrase the great reproach that should be leveled at Europe. Namely, quote, having broken the momentum of civilizations that had, that had not yet fulfilled all their promises, not having allowed them to develop and achieve the full richness of the forms contained in their heads. Here at work again is the logic of pseudomorphosis that does not allow the cultures subjected to it to develop their seeds and flourish, that freezes and petrifies rather than destroy them. In other words, that prevent them from taking on their own autonomous form, a process that, as Caesar points out, is conditional on the fact that the people who bears that culture first enjoys political autonomy. Very paradoxically, in Caesar's refashioning, Spengler takes on the feature of a prophet of, a, of the self-determination of colonized people. In 1979, in an article entitled La Martinique telle qu'elle est, Martinique as it is, Caesar defends the idea that there is, if not a Caribbean race, at least a Caribbean philosophy of life. This point of view he had, quote, bring us a little closer to Spengler, for, for whom the nation rests above all on an idea. Césaire is referring here to what Spengler described as the soul of cultures, that is the collective psychic matrix that governs their destiny from beginning to end. For Spengler, each cultural, cultural soul was, to, so to speak, a monad without doors nor windows, and then by definition, irreducible to any others. Césaire says the same, quote, well, yes, there is a West Indian idea perfectly different from the European idea or the Arab idea. And it is this idea that constitutes the bedrock of our West Indian culture, as indeed it is the bedrock of our personality, unquote. Everyone is free to deplore or not such affinities and filiation between the champions of the conservative revolution, Spengler, and the poet of black emancipation, Césaire, but we cannot deny such ties and we should at least evaluate their scope and grasp their implication. Spengler's philosophy also penetrated the English-speaking Caribbean through different routes, mainly thanks to the Trinidadian historian and Marxist theorist, Sierra James. At the beginning of the decade of the 30s, James had left Trinidad for England. It was there, in the small Lancashire town of Nelson, that he discovered historical materialism and became fascinated by Trotsky, History of, History of the Russian Revolution, a book he would continue to praise even after his political break 
with Trotskyism. But his interest in Trotsky's work was closely linked to another one, an interest in Spengler's The Decline of the West. In an article published after Trotsky's assassination in Mexico, James argued that one writer alone of the modern times has the same range as Trotsky in matter of historiography, Spengler, the man who wrote a book that is surrounded by, say James, a fog of mysticism, but nonetheless shows a colossal learning, a capacity for synthesis and insight. Unlike Ernst Bloch, who emphasized Spengler's inability to grasp the historical dialectical forces that generate cultural phenomena, and who only managed to collect fixed, finished, dead cultural product, James praise is, quote, strong sense of historical movement, of the relation between different historical periods and different places. James would later say that he had never accepted the decline advocated by Spengler. But what he did not accept was not the, not the fact of decline as such, but the idea of an organic necessary decline conceived as a fate. Jem, Jem, therefore, endeavored to extract Spengler's analysis from the conservative matrix in which they had germinated in order to translate them into revolutionary terms. To say it otherwise, to link in a manner similar to Mariategui, the civilizational idea of the decline of the West and the Marxist thesis of the collapse of imperialist capitalism as a prelude to socialist rebirth. Moreover, and this has scarcely been noticed in James' scholarship, in the Black Jacobins, James appropriated Spengler's morphological method and fused it, so to speak, with Marxist epistemology. As might be expected, the Irish Revolution has no place in Spengler's universal history. This in no way prevents James from borrowing from Spengler a technique of analogy that enables him to weave structural relationships between major revolutionary episodes, transcending geographical boundaries and breaking with the linear and homogeneous time of ordinary chronologies. In the Black Jacobins, this heart of analogy unfolds through a complex tetrahedral system uniting four revolutions, the French Revolution and the Haitian Revolution in the past, the Russian Revolution in the near present, and the African Revolution to come. Each is linked to all the others, as exemplary shown by the non-intuitive analogies established by James, by James between the third and third of this revolution, the Haitian and the Russian and more specifically between their great men in the form of three couples, Toussaint Louverture Lenin, Moïse and Trotsky, and finally, Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Stalin. In the Black Jacobins, James lays the foundation for a morphology of revolution that he would later develop and which radically challenges the traditional chronotopes of revolution. Apart from Spengler's influence, James draws on the whole motif of the decline and fall of civilization in its modern variant, codified at the end of the 18th century by Edward Gibbon on the basis of the paradigmatic case of the Roman Empire. This motif informed James' 1937 anti-Stalinist book, World Revolution, subtitled The Rise and Fall of the Communist International. James reinvents such declinist motif in the book he devotes at the turn of the 50s to Herman Melville, and more specifically to Moby Dick, under, under the title Mariners, Renegades, and Other Castaways, the story of Herman Melville and, and the world we live in, written for the most part in jail on Ellis Island of the coast of New York. According to Jen, the story of the voyage of Melville's whaling ship, the Pequod, was nothing but, in the past future tense, the story of, quote, the voyage of modern civilization in seeking its destiny. If the heroes of Melville's anonymous crew, 
the working class of all countries and all colors do not revolt against barbarism, their fate, James Oryu, would be the same as that of the Picard, which sank to the bottom of the ocean under the blows of the whale's terrible vengeance, a wreck of civilization. The civilization powers, the powers of scientific and technological rationality, embodied in the fictional past by Captain Hahab and in the real present by Hitler and Stalin, are turning against this very civilization, which is running toward its own demise, working at its self-destruction. It's worth noting the striking affinities between this idea and those put forward a few years earlier by Adorno, another cautious reader of Spengler and Horkheimer in their dialectics of enlightenment, but here have on other topics, no connection were established and the profound reasons for the failed encounter between Western Marxism and anti-colonial Marxism still needs to be retrieved. As a concluding part, I would like to return to African-American criticism by focusing on another's or Spengler's book, published in 1933, The Hour of Decision. A more literal translation from the German would be Decisive Years. Some critics, Bloch, Burkarin, and others, perceive, rightly no doubt, in this book, the concretization of Spengler's fascist becoming. The starting point of the books remains the theme, the decline of the West, which now takes the dual form of the crisis of Western civilization and the fall of European hegemony on a global scale. The main thesis of Spengler is that a colored world revolution, which was foreshadowed and prepared by the Soviet revolution as a process of reorientalization of Russia, a colored world revolution is germinating and can only be defeated if, in the first time, the class struggle in Western countries is suppressed and the socialist and communist organization are subdued. Almost immediately translated into, Eng into English, Hours of Decision was a great success in the United States, where it was closely associated with another work, The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy, published in 1929 by the historian Lothrop Stoddart who had previously written a doctoral thesis on the Haitian Revolution, full of rationalist and racist assumptions, which James will soon oppose in the Black Jacobins. But Spengler Books was also echoed in the African-American press, particularly in the, in the crisis, the journal founded by Du Bois of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. At the beginning of 1934, Mary Van Cleek, a socialist and women's rights activist, published in it a review in which she declared, in line with the European Marxist critic of Spengler's book, that it provided an ideological and philosophical rationalization of the anti-Semitic program of Hitlerism by throwing an inverted light on it. Spengler's hour, hour of decision was the proof that Hitlerism reversed the real causal relationship between the material economic conflict and the racial conflict to which Spengler now gave not only a German or European, but a global dimension. But the reception of the decisive years of uh, hours of decision became more complex and ambivalent the following months again in the crisis, where extracts of the book were published. In this extract, the author, portrayed here as a prophet of doom, asserted that people of color were from now on ready to act autonomously and to be the vanguard of a global revolt that would sign the definitive downfall of the Western civilization, which leaves Spengler no longer hesitate to identify with the white race. But such a revolt, Spengler confesses, will be nothing but a just backlash, a boomerang effect, since the white people had never stopped exploiting the darker races to the point of en enlisting them in their own wars, this culminating in the First World War. A decade later, in another journal founded by Du Bois, Feiland, Spengler, the, the philosopher with the voice of Cassandra, as he, as he is called here, is once again mobilized and quoted extensively because, better than many European intellectuals of his time, 
and false friend of black emancipation, he had understood the world of color. In his own words, that he had understood that after two world wars, the peoples of color, quote Spengler, filled with a burning hatred of Europe, feeling their own common threat and the weakness of the others, the Europeans, were now plainly conscious that, quote, again, it was possible to pay back the white peoples for all the pains and the humiliation of a century, unquote. What is at work here is a genuine anti-racist strategy of quotation, which seeks to detach, to detach targeted passages from Spengler's book and conscientiously omit those other passages in which he calls on the West to rise up. This strategy turns Spengler's weapons against Spengler and against the West and make of the hour of decision, so to speak, a spoil of war in the fight against white supremacy. The making of such a colored world revolution was recounted by Josh Wheeler, a rather atypical figure in the Harlem Renaissance, also close to Mencken, first in fictional and conspiracy form in a serial novel published from 1936 onwards in the Pittsburgh Courier under the title The Black International, followed by The Black Empire. And then in 1938, in a realist historical fashion, and much more concisely, in the crisis, in an article entitled The Rise of the Black International. In this text, Schriller describes the gradual unification of people of colors in the 20th century and its counterpart, the growing division of the white peoples as a result of wars between nation and the class struggle. The crucial moment was the First World War, after which, quote, Schriller, Spengler, and Stoddard wrote gloomily of the decline of the West and the rising tide of color. Here, Schriller is much more in tune with Spengler's thesis than with the criticism leveled at him by Mary Van Cleek in the same journal some years before. For Schriller, the capitalist system is merely the dominant, structuring expression of the larger hegemony of the white world the race struggle as precedence of other, as precedence of other class struggle. The new Negro, as he calls him, must rise up against the white international by continuing to walk towards building a black international of liberation. The last sentence of the article reads, quote, he, the new Negro, is the, is the Damoclean sword dangling over the white world. Everywhere it is on the march, he is on the march, he cannot be stopped, and he knows it. It should be noted, to be fair, that from the 40s onwards, Schuyler largely swung to the far right, going so far as to support Senator McCarthy in his communist witch hunt, and to level harsh criticism at the civil rights movements, at Martin Luther King in particular. A conclusion and opening. In 1964, Barely a month after breaking with the nation of Islam, Malcolm X gave a lecture on the Black Revolution. Asked about his relationship with Marx, he admitted that he knew little about the theoretical foundations of Marxism. But he added that, quote, there was this man who wrote The Decline of the West, Spengler, and who also had another book that is a little, a little lesser known called The Hour of Decision. In this book, Malcolm X continued, Spengler argued, quote, that the initial stages of the world revolution would make people forced to line up along class lines. But he also asserts, Spengler, or predicted that, quote, Malcolm X, after a while, the class line would run out and it would be a lineup based upon race. Spengler was right in his prophecy. This has actually taken place, Malcolm X adds. Quote, today the blocks that exist in the United Nations are based on race along color lines. You have your Arab, Afro-Asian bloc. They are all black, brown, red, or yellow. You have your other blocks and your other blocks. But when you find those blocks, you usually find everybody in them as something in common and the most that they have in common, usually, it's the color of their skin or the absence of color from the skin. Let's face it, 
Malcolm X is repeating Spengler creed to the letter. Are we to conclude, as some would do unscrupulously, that Malcolm X is a black fascist, like the Spengler of the Hour of Decision was undoubtedly a white fascist? No, not immediately at least, since there is a crucial difference in terms of standpoints. Whereas the later Spengler speaks of the decline of the West and of the colored world revolution from the point of view of the West, the former Malcolm X speaks of it, of them, from the point of view of the peoples of color. Whereas the later Spengler feels and is afflicted by the end of white supremacy, the former Malcolm X feels the hope of the emerging black power. This difference certainly does not explain everything, but taking it, take, taking it into account should be the starting point for any serious assessment of anti-colonial and anti-racist refashioning of the discourses of the decline of the West, and more broadly, of anti-colonial and anti-racist appropriations and transformation of Western anti-emancipation theories. Thank you very much. And I took one hour. And I skipped some passages. I think it was more one hour and 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Mathieu. Um, let me... So we... I will um, arrange something here in the background, but um, we have a good amount of time for questions. Um, I would say we we kind of scheduled it until 5.30, but we can probably overrun a little bit um, depending how it goes. So please um, raise your hands if you'd like to speak your question. Um, I can unmute you if you'd like to type a question. You can do that in the Q&A functionality. Um, yeah, I hope we can start like that. Um, are there any questions? Uh, let's give it a moment. Gregory, okay. I will ask you to unmute. I hope that works. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Marvelous, marvelous. Right, um, Mattia, thank you very much indeed. That was an absolutely, um, absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, I, I, I perhaps a not very specific question. Um, where, where are you going with this, with this analysis? Because, I mean, I've got no issue with anything you've said here whatsoever. But I can see just so many more areas. Um, of the non-European world where, where a similar kind of analysis would, would reap similar kinds of dividends um, in, in terms of this scholarship. And I, I just wondered what the, um, the, the limits of your project are. I mean, will you continue to kind of North Africa or, or the Eastern Littoral or, or Turkey or, or where, where, where is the, uh, the limits of your um, emancipatory Spengler project? Answer now or later? No? no. Sorry? I answer now to the question. After one, for me, it's better. But... Yeah, I think for now we can do that. And then depending how many hands we have, maybe later okay. we can take them together. Okay, that's a very good question. This uh, last semester, I taught a course on the, on the global Spangler, like trying to cover all regions. <laughs> Uh, of the world, except in Europe, because I really I don't want to to work on uh, Heideggerian readings or Wittgenstein's reading of Spengler. Maybe it's interesting, but it's not what I want to to do. So it was divided in uh, different parts. Uh, a lot I, I did a lot on the Caribbean uh, reading because it's what I, I I I know the best. But I also uh, I started with Russian 
appropriation spender, which are always very ambivalent, and uh, continues with uh, uh, Jewish appropriation in Spegler, which are very different from each other because you have texts from rabbis uh, in the early 20s uh, in, in German. It's quite difficult for me, but I try. And But there are also texts for uh, of someone who did um, maybe the first PhD thesis dissertation uh, in Germany on Spengler, who was a Jewish Russian called Abba Ymir, who, who became one of the founder of revolutionary Zionism, and which is which may be part of the fascist reading of Spengler. I continued with Mohamed Iqbal in his reconstructing, uh, 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 reconstructing the don't remember, reconstruire la pensée, reconstructing the religious thinking of Islam. And I try to do this, spending a lot of time on uh, Latin America because it's uh, a lot, very lot of, of reading, especially in the indigenous movement. I said only a few words here, but there are so many uh, influences. And I don't know, I uh, because I know that there are much more to do. And... Uh, I try to do to do it, man. I think that, yeah, I'm interested here in the not only in the, in the in the motif of the decline of the West, but what the anti-colonial and progressive revolutionary thinkers in the non-West had done uh, did with uh, uh, with works, books, uh, thoughts that in Europe in the West played a very uh, conservative and fascist and, and uh, most of the time fascist uh, role. So there would be some others probably. Thank you. Um, Alberto, did you? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks so much, Mathieu, for an absolutely uh, uh, scintillating, extremely rich talk. I was wondering maybe following on um, Gregory's point, if we could um, tease out or distinguish different aspects of Spengler's work in what you've mapped that lend themselves to that um, anti-racist and anti-colonial refunctioning, right? But which might be uh, distinct from one another and perhaps not all of them have the same potentialities, I suppose. So the, the, I mean, and you can you can tell me if this uh, in any way um, reflects your own analysis or readings. I mean, the, the first, which seems very evident is the, ex, you know, in a sense, uh, despite his own uh, uh, commitment to white supremacy, so to speak, nevertheless, anti-Eurocentric uh, element, right? Not, not In fact, the, the, in a sense, even the notion of Europe comes entirely undone uh in in spengler's work so that philosophy of history moment right that you you map out is obviously extremely significant as a way of just undoing the very premises right of a of a civilizational progressive and assimilatory version including in its in its liberal variant but then there's other aspects right and we had as a previous speaker here um donna jones who's written about much of the same uh material uh to some extent and one of the aspects of what she's worked on for instance uh is the question of the place of of vitalism right in negritude and in other anti-colonial uh, stances and that I, in a sense is a distinct element right like you could break with the eurocentric philosophy of history without necessarily thinking that uh peoples or races or 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 groups can be thought of mor morphologically and historically as having kind of souls, right? Or like you, you, you don't need to to take that position on. And I suppose, lastly, another element, and that maybe comes through more in that really interesting analysis that you make of the uses of our decision, um, is because of the plurality of cultures or indeed civilizations, a kind of 
polemology, like a kind of thinking of, of conflict, right? Um, and in this case, the, the way in which uh, Spengler um, maps out in declinist and kind of uh, almost paranoid senses the figure of a race war, which is then flipped by someone like Malcolm X, right? So I guess my, my, my question was in a way whether we whether in your reading of this global Spengler and especially the anti-colonial dimensions, whether all of these aspects um, necessarily fuse together or whether they have separate uses. And then the last one is just a comment. And I was wondering uh, if any of the uh, comments, uh, any of the readers in the 30s that you mentioned of Hour of Decision respond to that particularly striking passage at the very end where Spengler says, one thing is even worse than the color world revolution is the coming together of the class war and the race war, right? And then he has this short speculation about this kind of Caesarist white leader that will then be able to, you know, uh, uh, appropriate, uh, um, you know, uh, racial antagonism and so on. So I was just kind of curious if that came up in any of the material that you were looking at. Thank you very much. Uh, I think definitely there are, the, there are different uses and separate uses of Spengler. Some are taking something in the book, others are taking something else. And among those uh, different, di di different dimensions, Spengler, there is sure there is philosophy of history or just the idea of the decline of the West. And um, and its counterpart, which is not so evident uh, in Spengler, that is that another cu culture will take the place, or other cultures in the in the plural will take the place occupied by uh, by the West. Uh, somewhere, Spengler say that Russia will be the next because the Russian Revolution was not a process of Westernization, according to Spengler. It was just uh, apparently a process of westernization, but in reality, it was the old uh, Russian soul uh, that had been blocked by the Western pseudomorphosis that uh, awakened at, at this moment. But it's the, um, yeah, it's, you know, this idea, I think it's pivotal, the, 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 the possibility of uh, the emergence or the re the awakening of other cultures uh, is central in uh, appropriation of of Spengler. Something different, distinct, uh, and not uh, necessarily related is the appropriation of the notion of Spengler's notion of race, uh, and that's very connected to what you say about vitalism uh, is organic conception of race and the fact that in Spengler race is not uh, as such bi biological it's a environmentalist conception of race as shaped by what he called the landscape because when the I don't know. English people came to America. They they became they became something else after some the colonizer after some generation. So th there is this idea in in, uh, in Spengler that it is the landscape that uh, that makes that makes the race. Uh, yeah, uh, it's central. Even if today, if you, it, it doesn't mean at all that Spengler uh, couldn't be used in a, in a properly rest, in properly racist ways, and uh, there are uh, um, uh, articles now on uh, by white supremacist. I forgot his I forgot his name. On, uh, on on Spengler and eugenics, and you can use uh, Spengler is using uh, white supremacist milieu for defending uh, uh, 
race uh, 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 racist ideas. Yes, for uh, I also agree with what you say about if he's thinking of conflict and race war, which can be used in many ways. And there is someone, so, uh, some uh, something similar to kind of use that are made of uh, couch mix works. Something, yeah, something similar. And finally, on class war and race war coming together, I think that earlier in the book, Spengler even say that uh, the class war will not really be fused with the race war, but integrated in it. And what prepared this for Spengler is that the fact that the Russian Revolution as class war was in in a, in reality, or um, a kind of race war, uh, because it it was related to a process of orientalization of Russia and the fact that the Soviet uh, so, uh, Soviet power um, supported the the movement of national liberation, anti-colonial liberation was a proof of this turning of Russia to the East. And it's a very classic, classical argument at this period it, that the, the move of the capital from, from the Western St. Petersburg to Eastern Moscow was the sign of this. It's nothing original in Spengler, but it makes of this uh, topos uh, is on use, but maybe there are much more um, references to our decision. I just looked in the in the crisis, the journal, the crisis, and in uh, Phylon, and in this uh, conference of Malcolm X. Thank you. And I was also looking uh, because some people say that. Uh, through this guy, Mencken, and with this Mencken, Spengler, the decline of the West, had a great influence on the Harlem Renaissance, but I couldn't find anything except the, the quotation in the Langston Hughes um, short story I quoted. Are there more questions. I have a little question, but I also want to wait and not take the place. But OK, maybe I'll just ask my question <laughs> um, and um, please uh, put up your hands um, in the meantime I'll keep an eye and uh, try to keep it short yeah um thank you so much I mean you know I I feel like my question is only going to pick at a tiny bit of this really um rich presentation and and the kind of geographical um journey you took us on um I guess the question came out of the kind of Latin American um focus that that you had at at one point and i was wondering um about a tension that i heard a little bit of the uptake of spengler um by the different authors between on the one hand it sounded to me like a kind of organicist or almost a kind of primitivist um um, um reading um that kind of suggests um you know an emancipatory route via a return to something originary and and i was wondering how that sits with a kind of more historical materialist revolution you know kind of maybe what i heard in clr james and and, and so on a kind of uptake of spengler that um um yeah would kind of doesn't rely on a on a on an originary and precisely maybe a, a kind of organicist um recuperation or the autonomy of something that pre-exists but actually the yeah so I, I kind of I'm interested how you see that 
tension in the different readings and whether it is actually there and, and, and how significant it is. Thank you. Uh, as for the primitivist reading of Spengler, I think it's a good uh, way of putting it. And um, there is this in the Latin American uh, uh, reading of uh, or Latin American, not only because there is the Canaries and the and uh, Puerto Rico. So it's evident, but I could add, and I don't know what to do with this at the moment, that there are that presently or during the last years or last decades, there is a this kind of reading of Spengler in a, a neo primitivist uh, reading. Excuse me, just a moment. My daughter is here, and I have to. Uh, yeah, neo-primitivist uh, uh, reading of Spengler in um, in uh... Mathieu, your video is ah. not on anymore. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Just Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> in uh, how to say this? Um... Sorry, one moment. I need help. Yes, a neo-primitivist reading of Spengler in anarchist uh, ecology, in people like Derdan and those guys, which are tending to the far right, uh, sometimes. But it's, I think, it's something uh, important, if not really interesting, for me to to read. But I, I have a student who is working on that for 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 um, a small work, so I will. I will know more after this. And as for the Marxist, non-European Marxist reading of Spengler, yeah, the main idea in Maria Tegis, as in James, is that the, the socialist re, uh, uh, revolution will be a kind of renewal or reinvention of European culture. It's very Marxist, but at the same time, if you look at European Marxist reading of Spengler, uh, European Marxist thinkers uh, didn't want generally to merge uh, the Marxist themes of, uh, of the collapse. Um, like uh, we find it in uh, in Luxembourg or in Lenin, with um, with a culture critic, with culture critic, and maybe an exception, a critic of uh, European civilization. Even if in Luxembourg, as in Lenin, sometimes you find, uh, yeah say that the, you understand that the collapse of capitalism is also the collapse of, of uh, bourgeois cult culture. So sometimes the case. And uh, there is maybe an exception, which is the Frankfurt School or uh, people like Adorno and Bloch who, who are also doing cultural critique, but at the same time are abandoning in a way uh, the other part, which is the materialist economic objective uh, prophecy of the collapse of capitalism in, his, in its imperialist form. Thank you. Are there any Final questions. We are a little bit over time, so I'll take a burning question. 
if there is one. If not, I think maybe we keep it here. It's a good, uh, good moment. Thank you so much, uh, Mathieu, for this really rich contribution. Um, and um, yeah, taking the time and, and, and coming to speak and discuss with us on your research. Um, and yeah, thank everyone else for coming. Uh, one announcement, um, or maybe two announcements, um, if you're not on our mailing list um, and you want to hear about future announcements, um, please go on our website, cpct.uk, um, where you can subscribe to the MailChimp. And our next seminar in this uh, series on what is global theory is going to take place on the 21st of February um, also on Zoom with Nick Nesbitt uh, continuing um, the Caribbean exploration um, that also was very central today. So thank you so much, Mathieu. Can, thank can, you can I receive the information about the seminar? Do, do you have a list? Oh, yes, of course. I Yes, I'll send it to you. And I'll, yeah, we, um, I, the best way would be to add you to the mailing list. We can talk about that. Absolutely. Yeah, we should. I'll make sure of that. Okay, um, if everyone, um, Mathieu, maybe you want to stay on for a second um, and CPCT members and everyone yeah. have a good evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>